Okay, so welcome back everybody. This is the last video of this group. And in this video, we get to put everything together which we did in the previous videos. So we will go back to what is the bias. We had written it at this integral which had the density and the rescale kernel kh in. And using what we just learned about kh, we will work out what does the bias do in the limit of small h. So let's see how we can do that. Good, so I want to come back to the question, what is the bias of the kernel density estimate? And we have seen the bias of f hat h of x equals by definition the expectation of f hat h of x minus the truth. And we have seen the expectation of f hat h of x equals integral over the whole real line f of x plus y kh of y dy. That's how far we got. Now, this is an integral which has a kh of y here. And as we have just seen, kh of y is the density of a random variable. So we can use this rule backwards. We have an integral of something times a density of a random variable. So reading it backwards, we get expectation of whatever function is here applied to a random variable with this density. So that's expectation. The function is f of x plus y, but only y is the variable of integration. So it's x plus random variable, capital Y, where y has whatever density is there. And in this case, y has density kh. So that's the random variable we just introduced in the previous section. Good. So that, to my eyes, I'm a probabilist, looks a bit friendlier than the expression with the integral. And it's definitely shorter. And also, I claim that is relatively easy to understand. So first thing, if h goes small, then we have just discussed y is always centered around 0, and the variance is proportional to h square. So if h decreases, then y gets more and more centered around the origin. So for small h, we have y is approximately 0, and then expectation of x plus capital Y is approximately equal to expectation of f of x, which is constant, so we just get f of x. And that is what we want. Namely, for the bias, we take this expression I just discussed and subtract f of x, and where the difference between the two is the error. Here we argue that expression, expectation of f hat, equals this expectation, which is approximately equal to x, so the bias is approximately equal to zero. That's one thing we already get. Now, the interesting information is, of course, hidden in the approximately equal sign. So what I want to do here is I want to look a bit closer. What does it actually mean? And that depends on the behavior of f around x. So that's what we need to look into. So what we do is we will use Taylor approximation. Just to remind you f of x plus, normally it's called h, let me just do that here, f of x plus h is f of x plus h times f prime of x plus h squared over 2 f double prime of x and so on. And at some point you need to write an error term, so that here one could write as big O of h to the 3 or little o of h squared. And that just means that as h goes to zero, this term goes to zero with a certain speed. And if that goes to zero, then f of x plus h equals this. And these terms here and here also go to zero if h goes to zero, because they are multiplied with h and h squared, respectively. So that h to the 3 is actually important, namely this says this term goes to zero even faster and becomes negligible in the limit. So in the limit, we have this. And that is an approximation which holds for small h, well, in the limit as h goes to zero. So that means for points close to x. And what I want to do here is I want to be not so pedantic with the error. The price is we will not be able to 
proof proper theorems here, but we can still work out the approximations and get a result which at least makes plausible what the theorem should say. So let's not worry about the exact form of the error here and just write f of x plus h is approximately equal to the first three terms. f of x plus h times f prime of x plus h squared over 2f double prime of x for small h. Good, I want to plug this into the equation we just had here. So expectation of f of x plus capital Y, that's what we had as part of computing the bias, that is now approximately equal expectation of f of x plus, and now the role of the step size, which normally is called h, we cannot call h here because that's our bandwidth, instead it is the y. So we have y times f prime of x plus y squared over 2 f double prime of x. And just to repeat that from time to time, little x is not random. The only random quantity in here is the y. So if we split that, we need to take this into account. So we have expectation of f of x, but that's not random. Then expectation of y, and I can take out the constant term f prime of x. And then one half expectation y squared f double prime of x, where I again took out constant terms out of the expectation. Then again, the first term expectation of f of x is not random, so we can just as well write f of x. So that's what we get. And then we know these expectations. So expectation of y we said is zero, so we don't need to bother with this term really. And expectation of y squared is the second moment of the rescaled kernel, so that's one half mu 2 kh times f double prime of x. And we have proved this result here about moments of rescaled kernels. So the second moment of kh equals h squared times the second moment of k. So what we get is f of x, next term is not there. And then we have one half h squared, second moment of k, f double prime of x. And that looks not too bad, and it gets even better because the bias subtracts an f of x from there. So bias f hat h at the point x is, we have seen on the previous pages, that is f of x plus capital Y expectation minus f of x. So that f of x is cancelled. So what we get is it's just mu2 of k, f double prime of x over 2 times h square. So that's our result here. And we still need to discuss this a bit, but there are a few things we can already see. So first, there's an h squared here. So if the bandwidth goes to zero, then nothing else depends on h. The bias will go to zero quadratically in h. So that sounds good. But there is a catch, namely in the next lecture, we will see that while the bias goes to zero, at the same time the variance of the estimator blows up as h goes to zero, which is bad. And so there will be some balancing to do. There is an optimal h, and it's not h equals zero, because we need to balance bias and variance. We do that next time, but here we just see the bias goes down. Then here, that prefactor, we want to be small. And there are some things we can do, and some we cannot do. So first, this second derivative of f, that is kind of the curvature, how much the slope changes, that is part of the problem. So we cannot choose this, there is little we can do. It just says on near maxima or minima, estimating f is more difficult, there is more bias. And at bits where the density is a straight line with the constant slope, approximately, that is approximately zero, there is less bias. So the bias depends on where we are. Then here is another term, that is the second moment of the kernel, and that we can control. So if we were just looking at the bias, we should take a kernel which is as concentrated as possible, because then that's small and the bias is small. But again, we will need to balance this with other terms which control the variance, so we can really only think what is the optimal kernel after the next lecture. But we have understood how does the bias depend on the bandwidth, on the kernel, and on the density we are estimating. So that's a good start. So this concludes our series of videos about the bias of kernel density estimators. We have seen 
we can first write down an expression for the bias and we can kind of understand this expression. The bias decreases when the bandwidth decreases and we know how it depends on the unknown density f and on the kernel we are using. But I hinted already that is not yet all. So to get a full picture of the error, we will also need to consider the variance and there is some balancing to do. But I'll leave this for another group of videos, which I will publish in a few days. So for now, this is it. And you should go again back to the notes and read everything again to make sure you understand all the bits. And in the next group of videos, we will complete this argument. And in the end, we will get a criterion which at least in theory will allow us to choose the optimal bandwidth h. That will be our aim there. But until then, have a good time and see you soon.